Chef, these old machines look like medieval torture devices. What is this place? Ray, this is the very building where the American Industrial Revolution was born. This old textile mill built on the banks of the Blackstone River in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, back in 1790, was a dangerous place to work. These machines could crush and eat you like some water wheel powered mechanical monster. Oh. That's why this place hired so many young children. They were seen as expendable. That's terrible, Jeff. It's worse than that, really. And maybe that's why today Slater Mill is haunted. I'm Jeff Belanger. And I'm Ray Ozier. And welcome to episode 42 of the New England Legends podcast. If you give us just about 10 minutes, we'll give you something strange to talk about today. And thank you to all of our legendary listeners who joined us on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash New England Legends. There you can help support our efforts to document every legend in New England, join our community, and get access to bonus episodes that no one else gets to hear. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss a single story each week. It's free, and it just takes seconds on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, or wherever you get your podcast. All right, Jeff, here we go. Slater Mill, it's haunted? That's what they say, and I'm hoping we can find someone here to talk to us about their ghosts. But in the meantime, picture this. Okay. It's 1790. And the Almy Brown and Slater Cotton Manufacturers opens this mill right next to the river. Well, now, folks need to realize that though this place looks medieval to us today... It does. This was cutting-edge technology back then. Near the center of the building sits a large water wheel powered by the Blackstone River. This water wheel powers a central shaft that runs vertically to the top of the building. Then, on each floor, a set of gears run a horizontal shaft the length of the room with belts that run every machine in this mill. If you look around us, you'll notice something else, Ray. Well, there's lots of old wooden beams. There's that too, but check out all the windows in this building. Of course, no electric lights back then. A place like this must have only operated during daylight hours. To maximize every working minute, there are windows all around the building so people could work from sunup to sundown. They manufactured cotton here? They did. And if we start over here in the corner, we can see how a bale of cotton was fed into this machine that cards the cotton into these wispy tubes called sliders. Now, from there, the sliders are twisted and spun tightly into yarn, and then the yarn is spooled. Now, all of this used to be done by hand, and then a spinning wheel was used to make the yarn. But that's a slow process compared to these machines that could do the work of a hundred people without needing a break. Now, from here, the yarn could be dyed various colors and then spun into woven fabrics and other cotton-based products. As you can imagine, this whole operation was a huge investment. Yeah. And those Slater Mill had orders coming in. They were barely making their money back in those early days. All right. Yeah. You have to remember that this is the 1790s into the early 1800s. America is still a new country right now. There are many new American manufacturers like Slater Mill who are all struggling to turn a profit and get on their feet. So the brand new United States government steps in. In 1807, they issue an embargo against all British and French goods meaning no British or French products could be sold in the United States. And that's a great thing for American manufacturers. Sure. It means they can raise their prices because now they're the only game in town if you want yarn or cloth. But that's bad for the consumer because less competition means higher prices. And that's the way the economy works. The embargo helped in the short term, but then more mills began to open along the river to meet the demand for goods. Business owners sued each other over water rights, and domestic competition drove prices and profits down again. And that forced consolidation, which is how Almay and Brown were eventually bought out, and this became simply Slater Mill. Any luck finding an employee to talk to us about the ghost here? Not yet. You? No, nothing so far. All right, so I'm, I'm watching this machine over here. It's got so many moving parts. It rolls out, then snaps shut like a vice before pulling out again. This machine seems incredibly dangerous. This machine is dangerous. To switch out those spools and little things like that, you often had to jump into this mechanical mouth <laughs> while it was open, switch the spools, and then jump out before it closed on you. Wow, this loom is only maybe three feet off the ground. There's no way I could duck under there over and over, and I'm not that tall. (laughs) (laughs) I hear you, man. And and that's why Slater Mill employed so many children. Kids? Really? Children as young as seven years old would work a full 12-hour shift six days per week. And in the summer, those shifts could be as long as 16 hours. 
kids have little fingers that could quickly replace the small spools on these intricate machines. They could be taught the simple functions they'd need to perform over and over to keep the machines running. Plus, they're short and nimble. They can jump in and out of this death trap. But the worst part, yeah, they're expendable. Well, this is a long time before child labor laws, too. Yeah. And I'm guessing some of these kids weren't exactly children of well-to-do families. No, they weren't. And sometimes they were orphans or, or kids of poor families who had to work here to help out their parents. So kids lost fingers. They lost limbs. Ow. We know at least one report where a child lost his oh. life. Well, the records aren't too specific on names here. But we did find in the early years of operation a 10-year-old child was working on the cotton carding machine that slams against the cotton bale and then pulls the strands out with wire brushes. The child reached too far inside the machine to stuff down more cotton, then lost his balance, fell into the running machine, and was crushed instantly. Oh, my God, that's so horrible. It's tragic. Ray, I know we've both worked some dead-end jobs in our days, jobs that could suck the soul right out of you because they're just so boring. Imagine being a 10-year-old kid and facing this every day. It must have been like hell. What's worse is that you let your mind wander and get distracted. It it could cost you your life. Well, either way, this place cost a lot of kids their childhood. So this historic site has gone through a lot of changes over the centuries, but it looks pretty much like it did back in the late 1700s. In the 1960s, the Slater Mill, along with the Wilkinson Mill next door, were placed on the National Register of Historic Places. Also in the 1960s, the 1758 Sylvanus Brown House was moved to this historic complex turd museum. Samuel Slater once spent the night in this very house, and it too is said to be haunted. I feel like some of those centuries of emotions are trapped in the walls of these buildings, which may explain why it's haunted with voices and apparitions. Well, Jeff, good news. I think we found someone to talk to us. My name is... Carl Johnson. I am employed at Old Slater Mill Association as a senior interpreter and programs development. So Carl worked here for 12 years. He's guided tours through all three buildings on this property. He said one of the most consistently haunted buildings is the Sylvanus Brown House. Numerous people since I've started working there and before have reported seeing a little girl in old-fashioned clothes looking out of the windows of the house. She's never seen outside, only inside, and uh, a handful of people have actually seen her walking about inside the house. I have not seen her, but I've heard her voice so many times that I recognize that voice, a disembodied voice. People have asked me about the reenactor in the Sylvanus Brown house. When I question them about that, they'll say, oh, the little girl, you have the reenactor. They say it's a girl, she looks to be about 10 or 11 years of age. She's in colonial costume, and she's seen walking about. They'll see her in the next room, not making any noise. And I'll ask the people telling me this, did she say anything to you? Did she speak? And they said, no, she was just moving back and forth, made no noise, and we looked and she was gone. I'll let them go through the whole story, and then I'll say, oh, well, we don't have a reenactor. So Carl described the voice as just a giggle and laugh. I haven't discerned any words from her apart from recordings, but she laughs and giggles and she'll go, wee, wee. Now, Jeff, what happened to Carl in the Slater Mill building gave me the willies. We were walking through the mill, through the museum area, Slater's Mill. Actually, we were standing in front of a particularly dangerous machine a form of spinning mule that was built in 1909. And it is legend that children were sometimes injured or crushed in that machine. Well, we were standing there and the tour was interrupted when I and the school group heard the scream of a child. It was a real scream, an audible scream. And to me, it sounded like a little boy. A nine-year-old girl standing next to me said, did you hear that? Well, we all had. So I walked about the mill to make sure none of the children had gotten away from the group. And no, they were all together. They couldn't find the source of the scream. Okay, that's really freaky. Ray, I've been to Slater Mill numerous times. When we were rehearsing for our stage show, an evening of ghost stories in New England legends. Jeff, can't you just watch that documentary about that project on Amazon Prime? Yes, you can. And thank you for that ever so smooth (laughs) plug. 
so Slater Mill was kind enough to allow us to use their space to rehearse. So we'd be in the mill building upstairs talking about ghosts at night after it was closed and everyone else had gone home. And of course, the haunts of the Slater Mill were among the discussions. Carl Johnson had just finished telling us about how one of his colleagues had a scare recently when she was startled by a little boy who ran up the stairs of this building and almost into her one evening. But then he disappeared. Man, that is creepy. But it's twice as creepy when you hear about these experiences in the exact spot where it happened. It is. And so we're on the second floor in the room closest to the Blackstone River. And I look back toward the top of the stairway on the other side of the building and see this dark shadow kind of dart by coming from the area of the staircase. I'm like, what the hell is that? (laughs) I said to the other guys, and, and at this point, we all stop what we're doing and look over. But the event didn't repeat itself. The rest of the rehearsal that night, I found myself glancing over to that part of the building every few minutes. I'm sure. With so many centuries of history, with tragedy and with this place looking like it might have way back in the 1790s, I can't help but keep checking over my shoulder as well. That's half the fun of visiting haunts like this. Just being here, we become part of the story. While seeing some of these death trap machines in action, it's easy to understand how this may have been the end of the story for some people. But our story continues even when the episode ends. We're on a quest to chronicle every legend in New England, and you can help us by calling and sharing on our legend line at 617-444-9683. You can text us, you can leave a message, and you can share your own stories, ask questions, or leave us your feedback and comments. All right, this week, we got a few new texts, Jeff. Uh, We got one from the 774 area code. That's southeastern Massachusetts. It just says one word. Hi. Hi. But, Jeff, we also got a text from the 860 area code. That would be northern Connecticut. It reads, Dear Jeff and Ray, I love the weekly podcast. Thanks. Why do you think New England seems to have so many more legends per square mile than any other parts of the United States? That's a good question. It is a good question. I kind of feel like we embrace our history and preserve our history more than, say, other parts of the country. Well, this is a very historical part of the country as well. I mean, it's it's the birthplace of America, really. And with history going back so far, you've got people telling story after story after story after story. And before you know it, they become what? Legends. They become legends. And not only that, when you drive down some of the main streets of our small towns, that's what it looked like two, three hundred years ago. I mean, sure, we've got electric lights and cars now, but some of those houses are still there and still preserved. And some of them have a story to tell. And it's kind of easy to find these legends in some cases because there seems to be plaques everywhere. There's a (laughs) monument everywhere in New England. Absolutely. So cool. Well, keep sending us your questions. Again, you can call or text us anytime at 617-444-9683. Until next time, remember, the bizarre is closer than you think.